Okay, thank you, Justin. And welcome everyone for joining us this morning. Um, for the teachers that are on the call, we understand and appreciate that you're still on summer break. And thank you for giving up some of that <clears throat> precious summertime uh, vacation time to be here with us today during the first day of the New Brunswick Department of Education and Early Childhood Development's Summer Learning Week. So there are many different sessions to take part in this week, over a hundred sessions, I believe. So uh, thank you again for being here with us during this session. And as you know, we are recording it for those that have contacted us and said that they wish that they could be here but couldn't be um, for various reasons. So my name is Kathy Wynott. I'm the Learning Specialist at the Department of Education and Early Childhood Development for Culturally and Linguistically Inclusive Schools. So prior to coming to this position at the department about three years ago when the position was created, I was an EAL teacher in the New Brunswick school system and prior to that I was an English language arts and social studies teacher in the New Brunswick school system and prior to that I was an English as a second language teacher in various contexts here in New Brunswick in Toronto and in China. So in my current position at the department I look primarily at resources, curriculum, um, and other systemic supports for multilingual language learners or English language learners but I also look more broadly at resources, supports, and systemic change needed for um, the support of multilingual language learners across um, the curriculum and across grade levels. So I'm really happy to be here with all of you today. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing the co-facilitators of today's session on integrated solutions for creating inclusive schools. And I think we're in for a treat um, given the two co-facilitators that we have. So Arianne Malara and Justin Ryan are both part of the team at the New Brunswick Multicultural Council, or NBMC. NBMC is the umbrella organization for all immigrant serving agencies across the province and ethnocultural associations in the province. Arianne is the manager of youth initiatives for NBMC and one of her primary uh, foci in that role is to lead the Imagine MB program, which is a leadership accelerator for immigrant youth in the province. Um, and we will hear a little bit more about that later this morning, I believe. And Justin Ryan is the training and development manager. So uh, we're in good hands with his leadership this morning in this PL session. So before I hand it over to them, I, I really wanted to highlight that the Department of Education and Early Childhood Development, the four districts in the Anglophone sector across the province and the three at Francophone districts as well. And many schools work very closely with MBMC and its member agencies across the province. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that we in the school system are a very big supporter and champion of all they do, especially when it pertains to youth, um, but certainly not only when it pertains to youth. And it's definitely fair to say that MBMC and its members are a big supporter of us in the school system as well. So we work really closely together on a significant number of projects. And this working relationship between the school, school system and the New Brunswick Multicultural Council is one that we do not take for granted. In fact, we, we cherish it. So with that said, let's get started with what I'm sure is going to be an insightful, informative, and positive session today. And I will hand it back over to Justin uh, to get started. And Justin, I will be here, of course, the entire morning, but I'll be muted and, and listening intently at everything that you have to say. So thank you very much. Thank you, Heather. I, I, I feel that this will actually better be a superb session after your wonderful build-up now. You've <laughs> And I'm fine because I do this for a living, but Arianne's like, this is not my thing, you put too much pressure on me, but you know, <laughs> she, she's far too talented to worry about such things. So let's kick in. And one of the things we want to make sure is that as educators, people are being given the opportunity to look at and address the challenges that happen as they're facing an increasing number of culturally different children that are coming into their classroom. So we put together this presentation as part of the professional development to enable it to happen. So here's what we're going to be walking through for today. In the first part of the agenda, um, we're going to be talking a little bit about the New Brunswick Multicultural Council, just so that you understand some of the background and the support systems that you have. Uh, the second part, we'll be looking at understanding the journey that newcomers are going through as they arrive here and how that plays into things. In the third one, we'll be looking at, based on your understanding of the journey they've gone through, creating three different paths to enable inclusive schools to happen successfully throughout the province. And lastly, we'll be talking about what next steps that you can take within the school system and doing a little bit of Q&A to finish out as well. So let's start by talking a little bit about the New Brunswick Multicultural Council. 
We've been around since 1983. And essentially what we do is we act as a single point of advocacy and coordination for all the various immigrant serving agencies throughout the province. So wherever you are, relatively close to you, there is some sort of agency that is set up somewhere within the province that their primary duty is to take care of the newcomers and help them successfully integrate as they arrive here in New Brunswick. Our job is to act as an umbrella organization, a collaborative advocate, and a coordinator of projects for all of these different associations that you see listed here today. So while they're working in on immigration and working directly with the newcomers, we work on immigration and we help with the various group projects and discussions and liaising with the government that needs to happen around something as complicated and multifaceted as immigration. So what we're designed to do is align all of the efforts of the newcomers as they're arriving, align all the efforts of our members as they support them, and to build strategic partnerships, not just with the various member agencies, but with all the various government departments and other organizations that have a significant stake in the success of newcomers as they're arriving. So that's a little bit about us, but let's really talk about the more important thing, which is the newcomers themselves. One thing that a lot of people don't recognize and haven't been given the education around is that nearly a quarter of all Canadian citizens didn't start that way. Nearly 25% of all Canadian citizens started out as a citizen of another country and have elected to make Canada their permanent home, which makes them one of the, Canada the number one country for foreign born citizenships on earth. Now this is incredibly important because while it's nearly a quarter of all citizens in New Brunswick, in, in, the, uh, in the country rather, in New Brunswick, we're only looking at about four and a half percent. So in terms of immigration, two thirds of all population growth is happening solely through immigration. And within 10 to 15 years, it's likely that it's gonna make up all of our population growth simply because we've had lower and lower birth rates, which means that we've got fewer and fewer children going into the system to create jobs and opportunities and income support for more and more seniors who are retiring and living for longer and longer in retirement. So as a result, the uh, New Brunswick government set up the population growth division within the uh, PEDAL, which is the provincial organization around education, and has been working on attracting newcomers from around the world. And it may well be that You've seen that with just walk, looking down the street, walking into different stores, you've gone, wow, what's been changing over the last sort of 10 to 15 years? And that's largely because of this program, the Provincial Nominee Program, the PNP. So the people who've been arriving under the Provincial Nominee Program have largely been economic applicants and immigrants who are coming here. And it's really changed a lot of what you've been seeing, not only around the places you're walking, but within the classroom because one of the most interesting things that they bring along with their skills and talent and money to invest is their children. So increasingly, the children who are arriving are arriving in your classrooms. Now, if you live in the north end of Moncton, like I do, you'd be astonished to know that there'd been a drop in the number of total enrollments of children within the province. Quite an alarming drop, actually. Because here, we can't build schools fast enough when we're putting portables on them basically as soon as they're built. Why? Because so many of the newcomers are settling in this area, and as a result, there's a massive drive for education local. In other more rural areas, you might have seen schools closing because there are fewer and fewer children, and there are not enough population densities happening in those areas in order to sustain all the local systems. So part of the immigration process is trying to make sure that that is mapped out as evenly as it can across the province. But that means that there's a huge difference in who's arriving and how we need to look at that from, from an educational point of view. In terms of who's actually arriving, we have people who are coming here as skilled professionals. We've got people who are coming here to open businesses. And what most people don't realize 
is that makes up 82% of all new arrivals are actually economic immigrants that are arriving in New Brunswick. Another 10% are people like me. I met my wife while we were traveling in Japan. She's originally from here. It's a wonderfully windswept tale of international romance and mystery. So we got married. I came back to, to, uh, to Canada from Japan and I'm one of the 10% that make up the family of Gauls. The last 8% is refugees. And a lot of people find that a surprising statistic because even though it's 8% of the arrivals, it's 92% of the conversation. But this is important to understand because a well-educated, professionally trained person who has the money to afford to come on their own dime, set up a business or start looking for a job or arrive to a pre-existing setup job, buy a house, buy a car and set up, that child going into the school system is going to have a completely different experience from someone who's arrived from a conflict zone, whose parents may not have been literate in their own language, let alone English or French, who hasn't had to pass any language tests or economic tests in order to successfully apply for their visas. And so it's critical as an educator that you not bundle children who are coming from abroad into one large box because they're going to have very, very different experiences. Even if you do need to sort of mentally split them into a couple of boxes, it's easy as a starting point, not a finishing point, to think of them as independents versus refugees and high needs people. So with independents, they're coming here, they've often uh, had access to very good education systems, the parents are usually well educated and ec economically successful. Refugees may have come from situations where there have been significant gaps in their education where they've come from conflict zones, even if they were in a, uh, a school within some of the, the camps and those kind of things while they were awaiting their application to be processed, often the education is going to be quite spotty. So as a result, you'll have a, a wide discrepancy, a very wide discrepancy between highly academic, academically trained and focused kids who are coming in and kids who simply haven't had the opportunity to even access education as they've been going through. And it's important to understand how broad that range is going to be if you're going to re respond to the different needs of newcomer children as they arrive. As a result of all this, we need to start looking at creating new paths for children as they arrive. And in order to understand why they need paths that don't exist for Canadian born and raised children, I'm going to take a little exercise now that I call walking a mile in their shoes. So you've seen a lot of new kids come in, and it may well be that when you were going to school, you had to move schools halfway through a year or at a year that you didn't have to, that mostly children don't change, change schools. Even then, you've moved from a elementary school to a middle school and high school and whatever and had to go through that whole process of orienting yourself to a new school. But here's the exercise I want you to do today. I want you to imagine that today is your first day at school, but it's your first day at school, you're a child, and you're arriving on the other side of the earth. You had to get to school, but there was no bus system to get to school, so you had to work out what the local transit was, because really, North American uh, transit systems for school buses are really the only places in the world that have significantly established school bus systems. I grew up in Australia, I'd never seen a school bus except on movies and television. So you finally got to school, but the school layout is completely different to anything that you understood growing up. You walk in, you're trying to orient yourself, you're wondering where your locker is, but it turns out they don't actually have lockers in the school and lockers aren't a thing. Why? Because you're supposed to go to a classroom, you stay there and the teachers come and go to you rather than you going, coming and going to the classrooms. You're nervous, everybody's dressed completely differently. Their hair's covered in different things, their skin tone is different, the shape of their eyes is different, they're all very excited and talking at a million miles in a minute at a language that you're still trying to master. So you meet the first person kind of who smiles at you and you summon up the courage to introduce yourself. And when you say your name, they laugh right in your face. Why? Because as it happens, your name, in their language, sounds a lot like the word for stinky fish. 
And when they explain why they're laughing, you suddenly realize that for the rest of your life in this country, you're going to be stinky fish girl. That is, that is now your name. So you go into the classroom and the classroom layout is completely different. The subjects that they're teaching are not only different subjects from the way you're used to having them organized, but the entire way that the school system is designed to teach is utterly different from the way that you're used to. So you're struggling in the language, you don't know the class layout, there are routines in the class that everybody else seems familiar with, but are completely unfamiliar to you, and you're mentally exhausted. You get out to have your lunch break, and you open the same food that your mother's been opening and making for you for your whole life for school. And as you open it, one of the kids walks past and says, oh, what's that? It looks gross. How can you eat that? And all the other kids start laughing at your food. Now, they all run off with the rest of their friends to play, and they're all playing a game that you've never seen and have no idea, even if they did invite you to play, which they're not, you'd have no idea how to join in. So you get home at the end of the day, and your parents say, how was your first day at school? Our job today and through ongoing submissions and work, and particularly with the focus of Ariane's work, is to make that day go better for you, <laughs> but as the newcomer kid here in Canada. I want you to understand and empathize with the challenges they're going through that, so that when we're building these new paths, you understand where we're going with them. So let's look at these paths that we're hoping to include along the way. The first one is looking at the educational path, looking at classroom approaches, looking at curricula. The second one is the logistics path, having system knowledge, expectations, and connectivity. And the third one is the social path, because there's the in the classroom, there's getting to the classroom, and then there's getting back out of the classroom. Once we're out of the classroom, I've got to go and be a kid and engage and have fun and make friends and think about like becoming a leader in my school and in my community, all those kind of things we're talking about from the social part. So first off, we're going to look at the educational part. Now with the educational path, we are going to look at a couple of different things. The first one with the educational part is looking at the idea of how we teach. Then I'll be passing it over to Ariane. She's going to be looking a little bit more about content and talking about what we teach. But I'm going to start with this first part, the how we teach and contrast in the Canadian classroom approaches to those in international ones. So let's look at how we teach. And now that you're trying desperately to fit all of the world into your classroom and manage the various cultures that arrive, we're going to look at creating this educational path with a couple of key flagstones that we put down along the way. The first one is understanding the why behind the what. When you're teaching, yes, you are teaching content, but there's a reason that you've chosen that content. There's a purpose that you're trying to achieve at the end that transcends kids simply knowing stuff. There's a skill base and an approach base that as educators, you are trying to create, but that what, behind the why is not, so the why behind the why is not an international standard. The motivations that are driving the content is not common throughout the world. And we'll be explaining a little bit about how international content is often very, very different from Canadian content, but more importantly, the methodology that drives and how it's taught in the classroom is often completely different from Canadian pedagogy. And then we're going to be talking about building a culture ramp, looking at unconscious bias and barriers that we never meant to make and how we address them. So let's get into that first one. And understand that when we're looking at the word school, school historically was not what school is today. In fact, the word school is actually an ancient Greek word that literally, stunning to most people, means leisure. It means to have leisure time, to have recreation time. And students are particularly surprised when they hear this because it's the last thing that they associate with school. Leisure is something that you do outside of school time. But what happened was the only kids who got to go to school were the ones who weren't doing that, whose parents weren't laboring in the field, whose kids weren't doing all the household chores and feeding the chickens and doing those kind of things. It was for the wealthy elite who had the luxury 
to expand their minds and take on leadership roles and look at education. And that meant that education wasn't designed to be practical. What it was designed to do was open your mind and build character. You studied philosophy, the arts. You studied history. You studied things that didn't have an immediate practical application. That's what school was. Right up until the Industrial Revolution. But for the Industrial Revolution, for the first time, we actually had a need for an educated workforce. And with the educated workforce, we need people who could take records and do mathematics and build machines. And we need the people who could read and write and function. So as a result, we started building national school systems. And for the first time ever, when we were building national school systems, schools were being built in order to train people to work. We did a complete 180 on the purpose of education going from we are going to school because we don't need to work, flipping into we're going to school because we need to work. And it, this is so critical to understand because what the workplace looks like and the expectations in the workplace are reverse engineered into the schooling system. So let me explain a little bit more about that. If I'm in a hierarchical system and in a hierarchical system, the boss says you do, it means when you're in the school system, the teacher says you do. And you do it exactly like the teacher says, because when you graduate, you're gonna to have to do things exactly like the boss says. So that means that at school, information is 100% of what education is. The teacher tells you what things mean and you write them down and you memorize them. When it gets to school, that's what it looks like. And your assessment piece at the end is to say, okay, I need to remember everything the teacher told me. If I remember all that perfectly and can replicate it perfectly, then I get 100%. If you look at languages like Arabic and Mandarin, some of the largest and most widely spoken languages on earth, there's literally no word in their language for plagiarism. It doesn't exist in a con as a concept. It doesn't exist as a word because taking things and replicating them exactly as they were is exactly what you're supposed to do. And we'll get kids who have like been kicked out of college for plagiarizing and they're calling their parents at home and they're like, why did you get kicked out? And they literally can't explain. They don't know the word because they're doing exactly what their education system had taught them to do. So I was bouncing around some of these numbers with Kathy and she said, well, you know, when we're looking at how a New Brunswick curriculum is built, it'll depend on the kind of classroom we're talking about and the age of the children to an extent. But as some rough numbers, when we're talking about information, just purely regurgitating information you've been given, we're probably looking at about 20% total is just pure regurgitation. Another 20% is engagement. And the last 60% is doing some sort of critical analysis piece. Now, I've trained this with international kids and they are astonished to see these numbers. They can't believe when we're back here looking at the 20%, they literally couldn't imagine what the other 80% is. And this is critical for you to understand because if I said, I'm going to do a session now and you just have to do it by rote memorization, you wouldn't like it, but you'd know what to do. When we're asking them to work in groups and stand up and give presentations, when we're asking them to do critical analysis on information, it's not just asking them to do something difficult, it's a new skill that they don't have. And if you've naturally built it into your curriculum, you'll have children who simply don't understand this as a concept and certainly haven't developed it as a classroom skill. But we build all these things into our curriculum. So if you think of it this way, if today was Mandarin 101 and I handed you this sheet, automatically, even if you weren't an educator, you start looking at this and going, oh, obviously we're going to be learning parts of the face. And you start thinking about what activities you're going to do. Well, we'll probably do like a Mandarin version of head, shoulders, knees, and toes. And for an assessment piece, they might like white out all those words and I have to remember how to write them and label them or they call them out and I have to point to them. So even if you don't speak Mandarin, you have the framework in your head, you have the system in your head for how this classroom is going to go. 
what you have to understand is it's not just the content you are delivering, but the framework in which it's being delivered is often going to be extremely new for the e-commerce. So as a result, what we have to think about is building a culture app. Now, when I'm talking about a culture app, what I'm talking about is allowing kids to compete with equity. I'm not sure talking about changing what the outcomes are. But if you look at a school that was built 100 years ago, you would never see a wheelchair ramp, not because they were actively trying to keep kids with wheelchairs out of the schools, but because it wasn't in their mind to include those kids in the first place. These days, you would never think to build a school without some sort of wheelchair access. It's just part of the accessibility that we do. And the reality is that now we have cultural barriers that are unconsciously built into the system, the curriculum. And in the same way that we needed to build wheelchair ramps to enable children who wouldn't be able to access the school system without them, we need to start building different paths to enable culturally different children to navigate the system and compete with equity once they get in. So as a result of that, what we need to do is look at understanding that this is now going to be part of your life. Dealing with culturally different children in your classroom is going to be part of your life. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to send out a quick poll. And in this poll, which is the first of three that we're going to be delivering, I just want you to click on as many boxes as apply to you and asking about telling us about your professional development in terms of being able to deal with culturally different children. Was it something that was in your university education? Was it something that you've received as ongoing PD? Or have you never taken it? So I'm going to launch that poll now. So just take a quick moment to look at that and click on the various options that are going and say, yeah, when I was at university and studying, definitely dealing with culturally different children was part of the curriculum that I was trained in. As ongoing PD, I have sat down and been able to be trained specifically around techniques and approaches for dealing with culturally different children as they arrive in my classroom or you know what I've, I've never actually seen this this has not been part of my life so i see uh seven out of the ten have had a chance i'll let the last few sort of hop in and have a look and what i'm seeing here as we're looking at the polling is that it's most of you haven't actually seen this during your university education. It's not built into it. And this is something that we're going to be proponents at NBMC of changing and suggesting that understanding how to deal with culturally different children is a standard part of how educators learn to educate. It is refreshing to see a lot of you have had those ongoing uh, PD opportunities as well. Um, but some of you have never had, and this might be the first time that you've ever had any kind of insight into how to uh, deal with culturally different children. So looking at the second part of this, I'm going to uh, just end the polling there. And uh, there are our results for the day, looking at our university education. Most of, if you've got any, most of it's been through ongoing PD, but a couple have never had it at all. So, we're going to end that polling part there, and I'm going to hand it over to my brilliant and competent and extremely enthusiastic colleague, Ariane, who is going to be looking at not just the how what we're teaching, but the why what we're teaching. Now, we have some, uh, so, some, some sharing options along the way here. I'm not sure if we can actually pass the ball along the way to enable her to... Um, to be able to run it. So I might have to be doing some clicking along the way because I can, uh, no, I can make you the host. I'm gonna make you the host or can you already do it there, Ariane? Um, you have sh I'm, screen I, sharing capability yet? I think I should have that, yes. Okay. So one second here, I'm just going to make sure you can see my screen. Okay, we're almost there. There we go. Um, so if you can maybe nod and let me know if you can see my screen. 
I'm not sure it's the host well, pose. Can you? Um, Justin, it says that it will just stop the the. Um... Uh, I'm going to stop my sharing. Yes, exactly. And you should be able to kick in now. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Okay, yeah. great. Thank you, everyone. It's this um, this new remote world has us navigating through the technology <laughs> challenges. So thank you so much for your patience. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and uh, share. There we go. Okay, great. So, uh, well, thank you so much, Justin. And uh, hello, everyone. I hope that you're uh, enjoying the webinar so far. And thank you so much for, for being a part of our, our, our webinar this morning. So since the beginning of the spring this year, uh, MBMC has embarked into a, a consultation process with uh, the Department of Education and Early Childhood Development in the Anglophone sector. And it's this consultation to provide recommendations about what ought to be taught in schools about immigration in New Brunswick, including specific uh, recommendations about resources or tools that can support you as teachers into teaching about topics such as immigration or diversity under the existing curriculum outcomes. Uh, for example, in your grade nine social studies or um, modern history, for example. So why are we doing this? Well, if we're truly aiming to have a curriculum and to teach a curriculum that promotes pluriculturalism uh, in both competencies and values, we need to broaden students' ideas about how New Brunswick was founded and shaped to better reflect the role of immigration and multiculturalism in our history. So one key aspect of this is to ensure that students from K to 12 are, are learning about the important and, and different historical contributions that immigrants from all walks of life uh, give to both the New Brunswick and the Canada that we know today. And this is, uh, I do believe we have a lot of stories here, right here in New Brunswick, in our province too, about uh, stories that share the various contributions and strengths uh, from immigrants who may be arriving um, as refugees through economic migration, as international students, uh, under forced cir circumstances, and so on. So the telling of the story of immigration is about moving away from a Eurocentric curriculum into a more global and holistic one that presents the wider breadth of civilizations that have existed in the world and how a variety of different cultures, customs, and belief systems have influenced and shaped the Canadian country as it stands today. Now, to achieve this, we need to reframe uh, sorry, we need to remind students that they are here as a result of their initial indigenous settlement or the subsequent ongoing process of new arrivals. Um, we need to be having these conversations with our students. And when we speak about what a New Brunswicker is or what a Canadian uh, identity means, the curriculum should teach how and, and why immigration was and is a key aspect to the historical development of Canada and New Brunswick, including, very importantly, how the various immigration waves in Canada have impacted Indigenous peoples. So when students understand that there are a plethora of reasons and conditions of why and how people migrate to, to both Canada and New Brunswick uh, from centuries and centuries ago, this conversation must include dialogues and understandings that go beyond the surface level, level so that students can actually realize that everyone who landed in the unceded territories of indigenous peoples that we call Canada today is an immigrant and has come from different lands and mountains and their ancestors might be descendants from any part of the world. Um, and when students comprehend that we all have a right to belong anywhere, this allows this path of inclusivity that Justin has been talking to us about in these three levels, in the level of, of the classroom, because it battles attitudes um, that would go against that path of inclusivity. So for example, racism, discrimination, or xenophobia, while also focusing on the positive aspects and strengths of resiliency, determination, and commitment of immigrants. 
So for example, uh, those who are arriving from a non-English or non-French speaking country and have difficulties with barriers and, and language, they have just the same right as those who come from English or French speaking and, and may have a higher level of, of language proficiency, for example. So what have we done so far? Um, our committee has, uh, we, we've established an ad hoc committee, and this has included members of MBMC, but also uh, professors, historians, immigrants themselves. We've engaged um, Canadian and, and, and immigrant youth, uh, who actually Faris, who's on the screen as well, he has been able to lead that uh, as, as a youth himself. And these are these is a, the these is the um, the input that we've had for for this committee that for the questions that we've 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 um, answered, which are the following. Um, so the first question is more about a broader scheme as to what MBMC recommends ought to be taught um, in the K to twelve grades about immigration to New Brunswick. The second one about what are the most impactful ways for children and teens in New Brunswick to learn about immigration. And the third one being talking more about those promising practices for working with schools in supporting that teaching about diversity of New Brunswick's population. So all of the our draft ideas that we've been able to, to compile so far include these narratives and this lived experiences and voices of um, our members, the professors who have invested their time in this, uh, immigrants, youth, who have really have an opinion and a voice to, to, to answer in, in all of these uh, three questions. And what we're doing now essentially in terms of our next steps is um, we are in the process of finalizing these recommendations that will be submitted to the Curriculum Development Advisory Committee. And um, those should be in line by the end of uh, the summer, which is very soon. So, so this, this does provide you some insight into, again, the type of, of partnership and, and uh, working relationship that MBMC and EECB has established. But it's also, for teachers, it's, it's a reminder that the path to, to inclusivity and in building inclusive schools and classrooms happens when we teach and happens when we decide what resources to use to support that course content. And when we remember that all students should see themselves and, and their histories and connections to New Brunswick reflected in their years of schooling, that's really um, the path to really uh, enabling inclus inclusive classrooms in schools. Um, so I'm gonna leave it there and I'm going to flip it back uh, to my supportive and insightful colleague, Justin. Um, are we doing the, we're gonna stop sharing my screen, right? And then pass it over to Justin. Okay, there we go. And then you change hosts, make me the host. And the, oh no, you don't have to do that. We can just, uh, I can click back in and start sharing the screen straight away. Wonderful. <laughs> do anything, look at that. All right, so hopefully that uh, that page is coming up now. Clearly, yes, there's nothing fantastic. All right, so as we're going through, we, uh, we've been looking so far at one of the first paths that we're looking to establish, which is the educational path. And the educational path is looking at what we're teaching in the classes, particularly in integrating, changing the dynamic and the discussion that we're having around immigration. Because I remember when I was going to school in Australia, and really, essentially, the the um, the, the impact that I was given and the discussion was had was, you know, there were some indigenous people, but then, like, you know, Europeans came, and that's when history really started, and then it went through from there. And and going forward, it was the discussion of of leaders who really reflected the colonization process along the way um and while there's been a big shift to talk more about indigenous rights and and history within the school system my children have learned a lot about that when i asked them about okay have you had a discussion about the impact of immigration and and what like newcomers who are not coming from english and french-speaking backgrounds have contributed they shrug and really that's not part of the discussion at all and that impact is, is really missed so that's 
that's the what that we're teaching, but we're also been talking about a lot of the how as well today, uh, and the how is being driven by the why. At the end of it, the why is, at the end of a lot of schools, the kids have to go out, get jobs, and be functional in the workplace. In Canada, our boss said, hey guys, could you talk to Kathy, put together a presentation, and make a great go? And the expectation was that Ariane and I would work as a team, that we would divide our roles between each other, that we knew that, that we would be sufficiently skilled to be able to go and look at all those things, that we would troubleshoot problems together. Um, Jeanette, our boss who allocated it, is, is brilliant and, and very competent, but she doesn't know this material and couldn't actually do it herself. She would expect us to do this skill base for her, even though she doesn't have that specific skill base because in Canada that's what leadership is it's not having the, the the knowledge to tell everybody else exactly what to do it's having the organization skills to enable everybody to do what they do so therefore school is built around that in Canada we're in a hierarchical system they're coming back and the content that we're delivering is going to be delivered in those systems through a teacher says you follow exactly system which is incompatible with being successful and either in the classroom or later on in the workplace as children. So building that culture ramp to enable them to go through it and looking at a curriculum that reframes the discussion of how immigration and multiculturalism is officially taught within the school system. But that's all in the classroom. We've got to get them to the classroom in order to start teaching them successfully. So that's the second part we're going to be talking about is this whole process of getting to day one. So when we're talking about getting to day one, what we want to make sure we're doing is first understanding that there's a whole ton of system knowledge that as parents and as kids, they need to know. Coming here as a newcomer wasn't particularly challenging for me. Canada and Australia are culturally identical. I speak English as my primary first language. I have, um, my wife is from here. We have local family from here. She understood the school system. She was born and raised here in Canada. So understanding how to register from schools and how to like how the school buses work and what kind of extracurricular activities and how do you get kids home afterwards and what kind of lunch do you prepare and how do you find the classrooms and use lockers and in, in Australia, we don't like this whole purchasing supplies and this list. This wasn't something I grew up with. These were things I had to learn here. How to order at the cafeteria was a new thing for me, like setting up emergency contacts, et cetera, et cetera. The first time it was getting into fall and my wife said, oh, honey, you need to go out and get the kids splash pants. I was like, splash what now? <laughs> I was 27 the first time I saw snow. I don't know what splash pants are. I haven't gone shopping for toques and scarves. I haven't even spelled toque. So appreciating that it's already logistically challenging for a lot of parents to understand how the system works as it is for newcomer parents who are struggling with both the system knowledge and at the same time through a language barrier this gets much much more complicated to effectively enter your child into and manage your child through the system required from an educational point of view the second one is looking at the expectations as a kid growing up in australia the classroom behavior expectation, the playground behavior expectations were very similar. So I knew roughly what to tell my kids to do and more importantly, not to do in those scenarios. I knew what the academic approaches were gonna be like. I knew what the focus of punctuality was going to be like. I had a good guess at dress code, although I didn't know about the whole cold weather thing. I understood homework and, and what was appropriate use of school grounds and when they could and couldn't be on there and you know what was appropriate for a student interaction and particularly between boys and girls, et cetera, et cetera. Again, all of this is extremely culturally based and if you've been born and raised in the system, it doesn't occur to you that parents and kids would need extensive training in these areas. But these are very, very different things culturally and they need a different kind of explanation happening for newcomers, parents, and kids as they're coming through. So we had the system knowledge, we had the expectations, and the last one is keeping them connected. Looking at that connectivity, understanding that when I'm sending a note home for a parent, the assumption is that they can read. Now, 58% of New Brunswick people, including born and raised, struggle with functional literacy. So when we're adding on top of that, 
parents who are coming here who are still working out their English and French, plus the social dynamic when you're from an authoritarian, like dad runs the house kind of family, and that's the way that you were raised and that's the way you're doing it, and you need your 12-year-old daughter to explain her report card back to you, this changes a lot of the social dynamics of how the family's working. So we're looking at parental communication, school notifications, sitting down with the parents and having those parent-teacher discussions, what happens if they need to escalate as teachers something with the kid, what happens if the parent needs to escalate an issue with the kid, progress reports, updates, accessing English as intentional language, which of course is radically shifted with the pandemic as we're moving kids, uh, you know, moving teachers from EAL and other support systems along the way to cover for more classroom needs, other support services. All these kind of things are very, very new for a lot of parents and they won't understand how to access them and they're struggling with languages that we need to do in order to have this happen. So when we've got these kind of things happening, what we want to do is look at the, um, uh, the, the next part of things, which is understanding how we're going to, um, how we're going to make all of this happen along the way. I was just looking through, I can't find the additional polls that we were going to put in. I can only find the first poll on the way of the answer. But what I want you to think of is when you're looking at these aspects of system knowledge of expectations and connectivity at your school, I understand that as educators, you might not be in charge of these, but you're still going to be falling within your wheelhouse. What kind of systems exist at your school in terms of adapting these? to be suitable and usable for newcomer parents exist within your school system. That's what we're talking about with the logistic path is how do we get the kids to be going in? How do we enable the children to be, uh, uh, to be able to access, register, get launched for it, understand the expectations and maintain connectedness and communication as we're going along. So, before we get into the third part, which is social uh, path, what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick 10 minute break because staring, you get, we all know we've got Zoom fatigue and doubtlessly you've got your like two and a half thousand constructive emails running in the background and some of you may need to like take a quick breath of fresh air outside. I appreciate all that. We want to maintain your, uh, your, your, uh, your focus. So. It's uh, just coming up to 10.50 by my, uh, my, my clock here. So we're going to take a 10 minute break. And 10 minutes from now, we are going to kick back in and look into the last of the three paths, the social path, and start establishing what that can look for, like going forward from here. Okay, so take a break. See you again in 10 minutes. There we go. Okay, so as we're welcome back, we are going to be looking at your responses to the idea of whether or not, since we've been covering all of the, uh, the education, but now the logistics and looking at system knowledge and expectations and connectivity, the question of whether or not the school has adapted systems and provided newcomer focused education to newcomer parents and children around a very variety of areas. And what we're seeing is that when we're talking about the results, most of you say, yes, we do have sessions either through us or through our local multicultural associations and immigrant settlement agencies, or ISAs, of system knowledge. Um, fewer saying around classroom expectations and letting them know what kind of behaviors are appropriate and what kind of dress code, et cetera. Um, but I am seeing that a lot of you have adaptations in place to deal with parental communications and making sure that they are connected and understand 
how to talk to teachers and go from there. But some of you are saying, no, we actually have no adaptation specific to newcomers, or at least that you are aware of within your, uh, your system. Okay, so that gives us some insights into where we're going. So we're gonna move forward from there and uh, in those poll results. So the last path that we're gonna be looking at is the social path. So we've been talking about getting to the classroom and staying in touch with things that are related to the classroom. We've been talking about what happens within the classroom in terms of the content and the teaching approaches. But then the kids leave and they get to be kids. And as kids, they wanna make friends and play games and feel part of things and reduce their stress and be part of the social fabric that school tends to define what your social situation is and what are we doing to ensure that there's a social path for inclusiveness for newcomer and culturally different children as they're moving from the classroom to the playground. So in this social path, we'll be breaking it down in a couple of areas as well. The first one that I'll be going through is talking about, is there some system of buddies for guidance? And that's a, a, a big one that I'd like you to talk about is that there's something we like to promote. It's called different things in different places, but we call it the new buddy system. And essentially what this is designed to do is to get a kid who is in a leadership position in the school, who's looking to be a volunteer, but particularly kids who are already well socially integrated. That's the key. Because what you don't want is a child who's socially isolated to be necessarily the one who's trying to bring another child in who's to, to make them socially connected. You need a kid who's already well socially connected within the school system to be the buddy who meets them at the door on day one through all that mayhem and confusion that they've got one face that they know is going to take them and show them where their locker is, is going to walk them around the classes, is going to meet them if they're not in the same classroom in order to show them how to get to the cafeteria where they're having lunch and introduce them and make some new friends and join them in the games and do those kind of things. If you think about that empathy exercise we did early on about how isolating and terrifying it is to be an international student on your first day, if you've got a new friend helping you around the place, a new buddy as part of a buddy system to help you just get through that first day, it's a night and day experience, I promise you, for newcomer kids. And we would love you to be advocating for this to be included as part of the official programs within your school that would be tucked under, for example, some of the existing leadership and volunteer programming structures that you already have. You don't have to set up a whole new thing most of you already have some sort of volunteer program. Some of you already have some sort of leadership program going on. This is just one of the facets of that to create as a new aspect. The second part is, okay, now we've connected them in. One of the things we want to do is historically being the newcomer kid from an international school is not a cool experience. Sometimes it can, like people are excited for the new international student, but there's a lot of isolation and, and mockery, frankly, that can go on with the international students as they arrive from around the world. And what we want to do is fundamentally change that perception. So looking at ha giving them opportunities for sharing, to set up, for example, some sort of international student club, for them to give top cultural presentations, for them to give education pieces around their home country and their background to dispel a lot of the myths and to make children more aware of the world. If you want to teach kids around the West uh, about the rest of the world, the best way I know is to get a kid from there to tell them what it's really like, because kids listen to kids in terms of what makes a reality. And in a similar way, making it fun, international sports days and games days, multicultural events, these are the kind of things that put multiculturalism and the international kids on the front line of being cool and being the what's defining the culture and the nature of their school. And I'll give you a simple example. I went in to uh, do some of the youth sessions. We'll be talking about youth sessions coming up. Uh, and in one of the sessions I did, I brought in a whole bunch of chopsticks, the disposable ones, and I got the kids to learn how to use chopsticks because a lot of them had never actually used them or weren't comfortable using them. And I brought in a whole bunch of different items in a bag. Some were like little cotton balls that were super easy to pick up as soon as you've done some basic mastery, but they had more advanced ones. And the more, most advanced ones were 
dice and even marbles. And if you've ever tried to pick up a marble with a pair of chopsticks, I assure you there's an expert level that's involved. So what was happening is all these kids were kind of fumbling around, but the Asian kids who grew up with this were able to like, I had one kid make a stack of six dice, one on top of the other, and then he picked up the marble and balanced it perfectly on top. And he got the, he was turned around because all the kids suddenly did this big round of applause and he smiled and I got this kind of sense that it was the first time he'd been like the cool kid in class. Putting that kind of multiculturalism and international sports and games and those kind of things is a, a huge way of making kids understand and appreciate multiculturalism because that's where the cool comes okay it's in the events it's in the games it's in the sports like if you're the football star or the, like that's how you get to be a lot of popularity having multiculturalism being one of the ways to social integration is a really key aspect and the last thing we want to talk about is leadership now when we're talking about leadership i want to talk about internal and then ariane is going to talk about the external with internal, a lot of kids who are newly arriving don't see themselves as being leaders. Even if they were leaders in their old schools and in their, like, you know, captain of the soccer team or whatever it was, when they come here, because they feel like such outsiders, often they feel like they're not part of the leadership process. So if you have a path that creates school captains and, and, and leadership programs and those kind of things within the, within the schools, having specific targeted outreach to get newcomer kids at the idea that this is also appropriate for them is a really vital aspect. Now, in addition to that, there's a very formal external part, and I'm going to uh, be talking about that with, uh, with uh, my brilliant and, uh, and, and highly skilled, and this is her passion in particular. You see the big smile across her face around as she goes across this. So I'm going to quickly pass it over to, uh, to Ariane as the host, and she is going to talk a little bit about her absolute passion project. Thank you so much, Justin. And uh, just confirming everyone can see my screen. Yeah, okay, great. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And I just wanted to, to quickly add something onto something onto what Justin just said, which is very important. Um, it's so important that as we're in the classroom and, and welcoming, you know, new international students to not make that as to not continue that feeling of isolation and differentiation in the classroom. Like, for example, you know, I'm from I was born and raised in El Salvador. I came to Canada when I was uh, 18. And I can only imagine like if I'm in a classroom and all of a sudden I come in and the teacher's like, well, this is Ariane and she comes from El Salvador. Like everybody, you know, she's the outsider. <laughs> um, so I think that it's important, you know, everyone has culture. Everybody has culture. Just as much as I wanna share about my culture, I think it would be awesome to also learn about the culture and the upbringing of, you know, the youth from Petit Rocher or like, you know, another, town in, in New Brunswick. I think it's, it's important for, for us to use that as we all have an important story to share and we're all the same, just so, so as not to make students who are coming here from another country feel that they're like on the spot or exposed, that sort of thing. So just wanted to, to add that little, um, just addition to what Justin said. Okay, so, um, oh, am I, sorry, I need to go way back. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk about, um, external leadership experiences. And before I go ahead and do that, I want to actually begin, um, I want to tell you the story of two very unique youths. So I'm going to start with Ahmed's story. <laughs> so Ahmed immigrated to, uh, Canada in 2016, uh, because there was actually a lot of internal conflict and, and you know, war and, and very, a lot of instability in his, in his country. So he, as he immigrates to Canada, he finds himself quite secure and safe and he has a new home, and, which is wonderful. But he's also realizing that he practically has to start his life all over again. He is 16 years old. He's incredibly young and, and he's simply a youth that quite frankly got dragged out of this conflict zone and 
dropped into this new place and has to start from zero. And when he arrives to Canada, he feels he does not have a focus. Um, he cannot contribute. His first language is very different from here. So he has communication barriers. And on top of that, he doesn't know what school is like. Um, he feels out of place. He feels lost. So Ahmed really found himself not being able to get from the place where he, he was when, when, before he arrived to a now to a place where he's feeling lost. And now how is he going to even get into a place where he can actually contribute back to the community that has been so kind and gracious enough to take him in? So that's Ahmed. Now, Katrina also immigrated to Canada in 2016. But unlike Ahmed, Katrina came um, actually through the business stream. So her family immigrated to New Brunswick with a business plan. They wanted to start a business here in the province. Now, as an immigrant family who is trying to open up a new business in a new place where there's also a different language, it's not the same as their uh, back home, um, Katrina had a really hard time. So she was the, she's the oldest daughter in her family, and due to the fact that her ability in English is uh, a bit better than her parents, what happened is that she ended up assuming a lot of adult roles in the family, which basically affected this power relationship with the parents and really, quite frankly, affected her transition from a teenager into adulthood, right? She's only 16 years old. And um, since, but she, since she's the most fluent English speaker in her family, she actually had to be the one attending the business meetings with the bank. She had to be meeting with service in Brunswick. She had to be the one filling out the forms, understanding the taxing regulations for businesses. Like she's only 16. Um, so she be naturally became very overpressured with this responsibilities and, and she found herself overburned burdened with uh, negative emotions. She felt she had nobody to speak to. She felt really lonely and alone and feeling guilty about all these feelings that she's having while uh, you know, her parents are just working to provide a better life for her and her family. So, so I re the reason I'm telling you about Ahmed and Katrina is because what they both have in common, they come from very different outlooks, but they both have in common is that they both joined the program of MBMC called Imagine and Be, <laughs> which is what I'm telling you about. Um, so Imagine and Be, as uh, Kathy mentioned at the beginning, is an intercultural uh, provincial leadership uh, accelerator program for youth in New Brunswick. And basically, it's all about leadership development. So Imagine and Be, we're bringing this youth from around the province together to really discover a place where they can create in their own future and in the lives of others. So during this program, uh, both Ahmed and Katrina um, joined 24 other youth, uh, and they spent two years as youth delegates back in 2017. Um, and they traveled across the province. They were exploring New Brunswick's geography, really getting up and close and personal with uh, a local reality in New Brunswick. We went to Bathurst, Campleton, St. Andrews, uh, St. John. We visited nine different leadership retreats in this year. And imagine be really, it's all about serious commitment. So during this time, uh, the youth come together for intercultural leadership accelerator retreats, as we call them. And it happens over um, a one year, one year term. So usually take into consideration the school calendar and each retreat lasts about two to three days each. Um, and why is it, it's about serious commitment because both Ahmed and Katrina, as did the 24 other youth, were so invested. Um, were so invested in this experience. And what did they do? Well, they spoke about key different topics um, with the goal to really shine a light on challenges that are faced both by the province, but also by people just like them, by youth like them. And they really engaged in rich, engaging, and responsible subjects and each topic we approach from poverty to environmental issues to indigenous history and reconciliation we've all discussed those with uh, a variety of group of, of adults who come in with their an experts who were um, approached and the youth really come to this with an open uh, with a commitment to open discussion and giving a space for, for all viewpoints in this environment 
they also met with key provincial leaders. Like, for example, the photo that we have at the beginning is with actually that happened, uh, I believe, last year at where they met the, the premier of New Brunswick, Lane Higgs. And through that, they're able to meet who are the provincial leaders and who are other community leaders who they can learn more about. And not only that, they can share who they are. And it's a two to two peer interaction, like a two way interaction where they can share who they are, their personalities, where they come from, in all of their complexity and nurture, all these passions and callings right here in New Brunswick. They also developed strong relationships with other participants in the program. Um, many of them just as, uh, many of them have lived really through really hardships and, and a lot of experiences that can be really hard to carry and, and just as the stories of Ahmed and Katrina have uh, taught us. But the accelerators or, or the retreats, as we, as we call them, um, they offer a chance for the, for the group to, to really come together and support each other and encourage the sharing of personal stories and for them to really value their culture of origin, value where they're coming from, and feel that they're legitimate as future leaders in this province we call New Brunswick. Um, because despite all of them coming from different walks of life and experiences, their feelings actually reminded them that they're all the same and they feel the same and they they talked about their struggles and in Canada and, and immigration journeys and they found out that there's actually someone else who has either gone through a similar situation or has had similar feelings and they have found the courage to talk and speak up about uh, all of this um, and learn how to manage their emotions a little bit better. So each of the retreats we have really gave them an opportunity to, to express themselves, learn about how to be a, a leader, take care of others, and focus on their leadership path and their group life. Now, to, to contribute to their communities, we've actually um, had community projects that were all led by the youth themselves and they put all of their learnings into practice. So they start a project from scratch and they implement it in the real world, so to speak. So Ahmed's project uh, was actually to develop a network of support and friendship for uh, students with special needs as his, at his school. He, he felt a connection with them because he found himself in a very similar position due to the communication and language barriers. He wasn't able to, to, to communicate as he wanted to. So, what he did while well, he said, you know what, I'm going to make this project where um, one time a week we're going to come together and do activities like do some site visits. They went to the Sioux, they went to the Bay of Fundy. And this was Ahmed who came literally not knowing how, what school was, but he came into understanding how to connect with others who are going to maybe a similar uh, challenge and really like take them to the Bay of Sunny and Zoo and all these places that he's been discovering himself of New Brunswick. Um, so he's, it was a very outstanding project and inspiration for, for peer support. Now Katrina, um, she also had a community project and she actually chose to share her experiences through uh, art. And she brought her uh, community together with this really authentic and energetic approach to share their own journey with other families who have also immigrated to New Brunswick. And some of them were sharing their stories for the very first time. So it really um, allowed her to develop that confidence in herself to express her emotions and not bottle everything up. Uh, and also her artistic talent was just a gift to all of us. Um, so by the time this program ended, um, New Brunswick has really become the place where they want to call home and when they want to put down their roots. And they develop leadership skills in both English and French. And they make friends, they build this, they build this family network, and they actually feel like now they know New Brunswick, they belong, and they feel purpose. The participants, all of them, they walk away with this amazing leadership portfolio that really showcases what they've done through this entire experience uh, opportunity. And it's really about a time of discovery, of learning, of uh, reflecting on their lives and futures and really finding their place in the community. So 
all of this has been uh, really enabled by, by Imagine and Be and the, and the program that we've created over the years, as, long, as well as with the partnership, not only with Kathy and uh, through others at EECD, but also with the communities, uh, organization communities based here uh, all over New Brunswick. Um, so in all of this, if um, I'm wondering if you're intrigued, I'm wondering what you thought about uh, as you were listening to these stories and if as I was going through this, you thought to yourself, actually, I feel like I have a youth who would be really great for this program. Um, or perhaps you know of a youth in your classroom that you've seen and, and you really want to help them accelerate their skills or you, you want them, um, you, wanna, you wanna help them to, to really be more integrated in the community, but you have no idea how, well, that's where we come in just nominate youth and we will take care of that. Um, imagine be really, it complements and, and really enhances uh, the learning that happens in the classroom because it allows youth to, to really, it, it's all about experiential learning and it's about taking those, uh, taking that learning outside of the classroom and bringing what you're learning outside of the classroom into the classroom. So it's a very, um, it, it complements it very well. And it, it also helps in their integration, uh, not only academically, but socially, and just accelerates their potential. So um, we have, uh, we're gonna be sending all of the links that you'll, uh, that if ever you're interested via email uh, after this webinar. Um, but if you're thinking about this, uh, please let us know. And just to add that we are uh, expanding the pool of participants this year. The last time it was uh, focused only on uh, immigrant youth and this uh, time we're actually in, in, um, inviting um, Canadian born youth to, to join um, and to make it a more intercultural leadership program. So we're looking for indigenous youth, immigrant youth and Canadian uh, locally born youth to be a part of this experience and uh, together shape their leadership paths. So with that, <laughs> I'm going to, flip it back to um, our communications girl and uh, incredibly knowledgeable uh, colleague, Justin, and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Ariane. And uh, it's, uh, as, as you can all tell, it's very much a, a passion project for her. She's extremely, uh, extremely, keen on all of the things that she does on a regular basis with Imagine NB as well she should. It's a it's a brilliant program. It's given a lot of people a lot of options as they go through to explore what it means to be a, a newcomer and how to take on leadership within the program. So we're all uh, we're all very happy for that part. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the last part of things here, which is the uh, the youth workshop that I have and the youth workshop what I want to say at the outset is I want you to get excited about it eventually and the reason I want you to get excited about it eventually is because I was working for many years at the Multicultural Association of the Greater Moncton area MACMA. and I had a variety of programs that were running there and essentially when I was hired at, New, at the New Brunswick Multicultural Council NBMC formed an agreement for me to port over all of the uh, the workshops and start running them out on the provincial level. So we did that first and prioritized the adult cross-cultural skills training and that is something that is available to you. So at your at your school level we had done training and we done specifically train the trainer where we bring people from around the province who are the trainers at those local associations, the immigrant settlement agencies. And I'd done some initial training training with them back in December. We were just starting to get some momentum and getting them some practice when of course the pandemic hit, we closed everything down, we couldn't do in-person training, we didn't have virtual versions, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, I'm just in the process of reinvigorating that right now. But what that means is if you say, as a, a professional, I would like our team to receive a more comprehensive focused training session around how to teach into a multicultural classroom and how to create inclusive schools. If you let your school administration know and collaborate and reach out to your local uh, agencies, then they can say, hey, Justin, can you come and help bring us back up to speed 
on that particular module because we have focus modules for educators for health, for police, et cetera, et cetera. So we can uh, sort of bring them back up to speed and I can come out where necessary to actually deliver around the province. So we can actually do the train the trainer for you, which is essentially a, a, a much more deeply and expanded into version of the brief part that I talked about before around hierarchy and different uh, communication styles and those kind of things within the classroom. There is also a youth one. Now the youth one we were doing, and it was actually generally done by the uh, the school coordinators at the local associations, and they would go into schools and put classrooms of kids together and deliver these empathy and cross-cultural skill based training sessions to kids to enable them to understand the role they play in creating inclusive schools. Because in my mind, a lot of children don't understand the power they have. They don't understand that as adults, educators and school leadership and all that, they can try their best to make kids as included as possible. But at the end of the day, the only ones who can truly make kids feel at home are other kids. Other children are the only ones who really hold that key to the gate. And so when we go out, I train them around what I call the Spider-Man rule. For those of you who are Spider-Man fans, you'll know that his motto is, with great power comes great responsibility. It's something you learn from his uncle. And what I teach the kids is around that. Like, you are the only ones with the power to genuinely make kids feel welcome. Therefore, you're the ones with the responsibility to realize the role you play in creating an inclusive school. And then if I look back at who I was at their age, I want to grab me by the lapels and say, you don't get the impact that you are having and the impact that you should be having on newcomer kids. The little things that you're saying have huge impacts. And understanding the power that that can have is something we want to reach out. So it is something that you can say we're interested in when it's available and put your hat into the ring both for workshops for ed for the educators and and the uh, school administration but separately for youth and you can reach out and one of the things that we'll be doing after this training is we'll be sending out to you an info sheet that has for example links to contact your local immigrant settlement agency and a brief overview of the three paths and those kind of things along the way Ariane's nodding because i threw her totally under the bus to put all that together because i'm like that um She's smiling like, well, it was all great ideas. So let's have to write them down. We work well as a team. So youth workshops are definitely part of the suite of solutions that you have in place in order to help make your school more inclusive for newcomer children as they're arriving in and culturally different kids in the classroom. So that's for the youth workshops along the way. So let's look at the next steps that you can take going forward from here. So as educators, having sat in on this, if you're passionate about engaged and you think this is something that we should be looking at, this is something we should do, great, what do I do? Here's what to do going forward. And let's look at each of those three paths. In terms of creating those paths within your school, the first one is looking at creating an educational path. Embracing that culturally mixed classroom through, being ready for that adaptation is the first place. There's so many things that are put on your shoulders as teachers, as educators to get ready for. There's classrooms and supplies and curriculum and I got to teach in a pandemic. I get it, I get it. And to the extent that I can get it not living the experience, my sister-in-law is a teacher, I hear a lot about it. I understand how challenging this is for you. But one of the things that we're here to tell you today is that teaching into a culturally mixed classroom is now a core teaching skill. This is not going anywhere soon. Increasingly, the provincial government is going to be putting more and more focus on attracting newcomers to address the economic and socioeconomic and demographic challenges that we've been talking about. So you are absolutely going to be seeing more newcomer children coming into your class. Teaching into a culturally mixed classroom is absolutely becoming a core skill. Now, in my sister-in-law's example, for example, she's uh, teaching at Youth Cavell, which is an inner city uh, school here in Moncton, well over half of her students were born abroad. Teaching into a culturally mixed classroom is, a, is, is, is 
absolutely every day. And you mightn't be in that position yet. You may well be. But if you're not, it is going to be growing and understanding that is going to be a key part of things. So look at your standard curricula and those pedagogical approaches within the classroom and think, in order to create equity, what do I need to do? And when I'm talking about equity, I'm not, not, not talking about changing the goalposts for different kids. That's not where I'm at. What I'm talking about is enabling children to have the same shot by creating a different path for how they get to the point that they take that shot. So let me give you a simple example. I was once asked to um, speak at the appreciation supper for volunteers at the local minor hockey uh, association here. So these are all the volunteer coaches and those kind of things who have helped make hockey happen. And they asked me in because they wanted more newcomer kids to join in and they wanted some guidance on how to make that happen. So I said, okay, quick poll here. Who here had the smallest? Talk at your tables and come back and tell me who had the smallest pair for their first ever pair of skates? And they had a quick discussion. Somebody came back. They were, these little, they were like two years old and their dad was pushing them on the chair on the on the ice in the front of the things and that's how they learned to skate they could barely walk and they already had skates on and i've got to tell you as an immigrant that's a very canadian story to tell so i pulled out my pair of skates size 12 they were my first pair my first pair of skates were size 12 why they were a wedding gift from my wife true that's what i got from my wedding here's how we get around six months of the year honey ha 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 great sense of humor my wife wonder that recorded um but the point is that if a kid's trying out for hockey and he's 13 years old the assumption that nobody's talking about was that he was already playing hockey when he was 12 and he has seen ice outside of a glass of coke and that he can skate and he knows what the rules are and he knows who Sidney crosby is and like all these things are built into it so what i'm not saying is to give the newcomer kid a shot at getting in even though he's not ready. What I am saying is you really, if they wanted those newcomer kids to participate, they needed to create a culture ramp that enabled the children who weren't raised in that environment to build up their skill level to be able to have a genuine shot and compete with equity. And that's what I'm talking about in the classroom, is recognizing that these paths have to be created to enable children to access the school system, be successful within the classroom, and to socially integrate outside the classroom. So when we're looking at that inside the classroom piece, looking at how many unspoken assumptions are built into my curriculum that really aren't true for all of the children here because of their cultural backgrounds. So the second part, of the, the next part of this is, is seeking that professional development, like engage your local MBMC membership to uh, look at what cross-cultural support can look like, help get that within your school system. It is something that is available and we'd love to be able to help you with that as we go. So that's the educational path. When we're looking at the logistics path, work with your school administration to get these workshops and educational pieces to enable parents and students to navigate through that system, like enhancing the system knowledge and making sure that newcomer parents and kids understand how to walk through the complexities of the administration logistics to get into the school and manage and register on websites and log in from home and get your school account and do all those kind of things, that you, they are given an understanding of what appropriate classroom playground behaviors and expectations and those kind of things are. And this is something I'd really recommend doing strongly in coordination with the your local um, immigrant settlement agency, your multicultural associations, because they have a lot of this. I remember we put, we put together our first sort of soccer team that all the newcomers were in. And it, it was rougher than the local kids were used to. There was some hip charging, those kind of things. That was just what, what sports was. You went hard and, and we had to manage their expectations through the, 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 the newcomer-based team before they went out to general teams to understand that like what the level of rock housing was appropriate within a, within a, within a you know, semi-contact-based team sport. Uh, and then reworking those connectivity systems that connecting students and parents understanding what how they get to resources how they get to access things what the communications can look like 
That's what we're talking about in creating that second path, that logistic path. So the third one is that social path. Schools need to look actively at how they help students feel socially integrated, feel socially welcomed, and feel ready for leadership through doing things like creating that new buddies approach that we talked about, particularly the welcome on day one, so that the kids feel properly oriented as they get through the system. Creating opportunities for kids not to, as Ariane quite correctly pointed out, going, hey, look, all of the universe, look at that kid. They're like totally different and new. Everybody, big round of applause for the new, like, and then please open a hole in the ground so that they can disappear into it and never be seen again because that's exactly where they're going to want to stay. But instead of pointing them out, giving them opportunities to opt into creating like international clubs and opting into making cultural presentations and putting together activities, having international sports days, game days, multicultural events, those kind of things that are making multiculturalism fun and creating that path of leadership, encourage them towards leadership, nominate people that you might think are appropriate for the uh, Imagine NB program as candidates, because looking at creating those social paths and to normalize multiculturalism is crucial. So here's another thing that I occasionally do when I was going into the, uh, the newcomer sessions for youth, the, the cross-cultural skills training and inclusion sessions for youth. I'd say, okay, put your hand up kids if in the last month, you've taken care, taken part in a multicultural activity or eaten multicultural food. And virtually none of the kids put their hand up. They say, okay, okay, let me try it this way. Put your hand up in the last month you've done Taekwondo or Zumba or had some like the pita bread into some hummus and had that as your snack. And all the hands went up. And I went, well, why didn't you have your hands up beforehand? They went, well, that's not multicultural. That's like Tuesday kind of thing. And if you think back, like I say, I'm old. I was literally born before man landed on the moon. For me, this was not part of my upbringing. My parents didn't drop me off at Taekwondo lessons and then go out for sushi while they were waiting for me to have my... This was not what life was. But this has become such an integrated fabric that we need to continue this move that these kind of aspects become a normal part of the children's social fabric and the multiculturalism is something that is not just fun and cool and everything else, but more importantly, isn't something that's known as because it's just part of everything else. Because really at the end of the day, that's the goal. What we want is for the newcomer kid to arrive and they're just like every other kid. That they come in, they have the perfectly normal experience and they're not treated differently and all those kind of things. We've got a way to go until we make it that. But at the end of the day, it's not to make the newcomer kids feel special. It's to normalize everything about the world of multiculturalism. So when they're coming, it's just one more aspect of what's normal. It's just what, like having a music class isn't something that's changing multiculturalism. It's just, you know, adding a, a, a new dimension to what education is and making sure that it's not just math and science and everything else, that the arts is part of it. Having multicultural instruments, as opposed to the standard like European orchestral ones within there is adding that multicultural aspect to it. That's what we're talking about. So the last part in creating your path is to realize you're not suddenly supposed to, after a brief episode of a couple of hours on a Monday morning, be the experts in knowing how to completely redesign your entire school fabric and create three paths by yourself when you're supposed to be, I don't know, creating curriculum, preparing for pandemic situations and, and dealing with new children and getting back to school and filling out reports. It's not all on you. There are people who exist in the system whose only role in the world is to help make that easier for you reach out. So you have your local NBMC members, find your local ISA, your immigrant serving agency, make them your partner. If you haven't already, uh, work with them closely, make sure that you understand how to do that successfully. Um, and then I'll throw Kathy under the bus as well to put her on the spot for all the easy the, uh, contacts and information that you might want to know about in terms of what resources and training and support is being provided through the education system with a specific focus on making newcomer kids feel included. Now, if I have timed this as perfectly as I hoped, I've left exactly 15 minutes for the Q&A session. I found that picture, I just had to put it up. He's the cutest kid in the universe. So I did want to, uh, uh, to pull that up for you now. 
and uh, find out what kind of questions we had for Q and A going forward, and, and and for you guys to all leap in. So, reach out. Let us know what kind of um, what kind of questions do we have going forward, and I'll stop the sharing there so we can come back and see everybody's pretty pretty faces. So, lots lots of thanks and congratulations to everybody who's been involved in things, and Ariane, who's doing these kind of presentations, is is my role, but she's been completely like. <laughs> fantastic job but I'd love to hear uh, questions from the uh, from the floor so you participants what kind of questions do you have along the way okay now my, my co-panelists can't actually see the chat so I'll make sure that I uh, pass on any any questions as they're coming along see everybody's saying saying wonderful good job to to Ariane <laughs> oh, no, no. Um, Justin, could I ask a question? Far away. Uh, well, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you for the session. It's Kathy talking. Perfect. And um, I, I really love how all of you took a, a relatively complex conversation and made it feel manageable for teachers who have a lot on their plates at all times. So thank you for that. And my question is to Ferris. So Ferris, I'm going to... Um, Put it over to you and uh, not to put you on the spot but you mentioned that or somebody when they were introducing you mentioned that you were new here in the new brunswick school system at one time and given all of the information that we've just heard and that we've been thinking about could you reflect on that as a person who came to the school system and was new here in the school system in high school and what were the things that were most beneficial to you as you were settling in Sure, thanks, Cassidy, for your question. Um, yeah, I came to Canada four years ago. Um, I went to Moncton High School, and actually, um, I was like, I didn't, I didn't speak any English at the beginning. Um, yeah, so like most of my classes for the first uh, month or two um, were like um, learning English. Um, uh, I had the math class. But yeah, most of them was like EL classes with uh, with the teachers. Um, it was mostly learning English and um, like what I found most like um, helpful and like interesting that teachers has done is that um, when when I got to the class to the English class, there was like um, the teacher was doing kind of like interactive activities with different uh, students from like um, students from uh, different countries. Um, she tried to like um do like group activities with with the students to like uh get them talk to each other uh, like with different languages uh i mean in this in english that they speak different languages so um it was it was like uh, interactive uh, activities for students to to like uh not only like speak to each other maybe like <clears throat> excuse me um do like signs to like help each other understand like what they're trying to say or like um, what they're trying to to like like to under, understand um, and yeah it was a little bit challenging for me I mean um, coming to a new school going to like completely different culture here in uh, in New Brunswick schools um, but yeah like with 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 the, with the smiles of the teachers with, with like uh, coming to me asking me if I have any questions if I need any support I felt like really that was that was really great from the teachers to do, um, and yeah, I, I was happy about that. So, yeah, and here I am now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ferris, and and I apologize for putting you on the spot, but I knew that you would feel happy to share that. So sure, thank no you. Worries. Excellent. Yes, I uh, I think that having like. A top-down approach is going to be one of the most vital things walking through this. And I think having worked at one of the local associations for so long, it's always been a very sort of grassroots, push it from the bottom kind of thing that we know that teacher and they want to invite us in. And it's a very like sort of personal relationship and, and, and people you knew to encourage them to take the various trainings. And what we're hoping to work with with Kathy is to instead through making the recommendations that Ariane's making with the curriculum, but also like putting that as a facet within the total three uh, three paths approach 
to look at working with ECD at a very top-down approach to how we can encourage and create a framework for all schools to be able to pick up and run with making the, uh, the newcomers successfully integrated as we go along. Um, so, now, oddly enough, I have lost, now that I came out of my screen sharing view, I lost the ability to share my polls again, the last poll that we're going to be doing. As far as maybe you have a functionality in there, you can pull the poll back up because that seems to have, I'm just going to go back so, into screen sharing for a second. Oh, can you do it? Uh, so who's the host right now? Is it Ariane or are you? I, it is, oh, it's Ariane. That's why you have the poll. So you can either make me the host or do the poll yourself, which is just pulling up a little polling button and then dropping down the drop down and choosing the third one. Okay. Um, so this is the one that we already completed. Right, and you find a little drop down button at the top. And now just, yeah, I found it. So I'm gonna just launch the polling, the third one that we had um, done for today. It's uh, regarding the um, multiple approaches that you may have already taken into, uh, into consideration at your schools to do that social integration for newcomers. So we have, um, and again, you can choose all of the ones that apply to you. Um, so there's the guidance uh, about the student body systems and welcome wagons, and there's the sharing, uh, making it fun, leadership approaches. And uh, if you actually think, actually, we have not done much of this, we need to work more on that, you can also pick up the uh, last one, which is the No Social Path program specific to newcomers. I have four answers uh, submitted, so I'm just going to wait a little bit longer. And as we wait, I just wanted to uh, quickly say thank you again to Kathy for, for allowing us really to be part of this um, professional learning for, for, for teachers. I know this is a very uh, busy week for that and, and that you also have all these competing priorities trying to get um, yourselves all situated and organized for, uh, for the fall to come. So we hope that uh, it was very insightful for you and, and definitely we'll be following up with all of the, the links and more condensed information for you um, as you, whatever uh, would be more towards you, whatever would align more to what you're looking for, uh, we're here to help. Okay, so I have uh, the answers in. I'm just going to show the results. And there we go. So, we seem to have uh, quite a range of responses. And uh, as you can see, the, the one for the second one around the student-led cultural presentations is a area that uh, needs a little bit more consideration from teachers. Okay, so I'm not able to see the chat. I don't know if Justin, you can see if we have any questions left or on the chat. Um, oh, there's a question on the chat. Justin, you are on mute, so we cannot hear you. Sorry about that. Um, we, uh, we had a request from Lynn to share uh, all the questions from the polls, because uh, they're looking to implement at uh, ASD South, uh, a welcoming schools initiative in the schools this fall. We want to ensure we have everything covered. So we will be sending out to everybody the, 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 the outline of what those three paths were hoping to look like. Understand that we are building this new, so this is like the initial draft that we're sharing with you, but we want to tag this together with the recommendations that Ariane's putting forward on behalf of MBMC to the um, ECD around curriculum design and suggest that these are additional considerations on top of the curriculum issues that they, uh, they might want to introduce. So we'll be definitely sending out that list of information and as much as we can, a checklist for the kind of ideas that you want to do with social inclusive schools. So great question from that, Lynn. Um, and uh, uh, you're all being congratulated. And Fadis, thank you very much for sharing your, uh, your things. They were talking about gratitude of you sharing your experiences there. Um, Ariane, they were asking what 
age range the Imagine NB program is open to, if I understand correctly, it's high school, basically. Yes, thank you for the question. So um, the students must be entering grades 10, 11, or 12 uh, coming up this year in September 2020 to be, um, to be considered for the program. And uh, really the eligibility requirements are for them to live in New Brunswick, uh, again, be entering uh, grade 10, 11, or 12, and um, have uh, an average level of proficiency in either English or French, as it is a bilingual program. And all of those will be sent to you. Uh, those are the three main ones. Th those are the three categories, actually, for the eligibility. And then students have to uh, submit their application. But teachers can nominate their students. So uh, all of this information will be sent to you on our follow-up email. All right. Well, that was the last of the questions that we had. Any last questions? Because I think I, I timed it out to make sure that we had a couple of minutes for overruns and issues as we went along. But uh, I must say, that, Justin, I think we did well with the timing. I was worried a, a little and, bit about that, but we did and well. What did I tell you, Ariana? <laughs> Worry too much, everything's going to be fine. So, working with professionals you, here. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> to all of you who uh, gave up uh, your precious time this morning to invest it in spending some time with us, I hope that it was a worthwhile investment of your time. Um, we're going to be working very hard to uh, continue working on this Integrated Schools program. Um, and uh, yes, uh, Abby's uh, making in the background a, a note that if you want to uh, reach out for NBMC for youth who are aging out from the high school system and nominate for skills launch is another thing that we can do and we'll add that in there that some of the of the kids are I'm looking so much for an, a continuing academic path they are looking to enter into the workplace mm -hmm. and uh, Abby David who is one of our other program managers for that um, and is leaping in with all the usual passion for her is saying you need to tell them that they can always we help youth get jobs as well there's a wonderful skills launch program that helps match newcomers uh, with essentially internship opportunities within workplaces that get support from the government to pay them to go through so that they get Canadian working experiences and hopefully could, once they've established themselves over that time frame, could even get picked up by that employer to, so that the employer does start paying them instead of the government to continue with it and at least to have the experience in the field necessary because you can't get an experience without a job, you can't get a job without experience. The uh, Skills Launch Program is designed to fix that issue and allow newcomer youth to Canada, to, to Canada to get the vital work experience that they need, particularly within their field, to show that they understand how to work successfully in the Canadian uh, work environment. Mm -hmm. So to thank all of you along the way for your time, thank you to my wonderful co-host Ariane who has put it all together. Thank you to fellows who not only shared his experience but as our uh, summer intern came in and like created all the polls and did a lot of the background logistics so it makes us look good because everything works smoothly in the background and particularly thank you to you Kathy for reaching out not only to in terms of setting up today and giving us a platform to connect directly with educators but you've been a vital link with ECD to continue working with the youth and on the youth programs. So thank you to yourself and all the support level at ECD. We're really looking forward to putting together the recommendations. Um, Kathy, a final word from you to close us out? Yes, and the timing, as Aria noted, is impeccable. Here we are at 11.58, so this is right on time. So thank you to you, Justin, Ariane, and Ferris um, for presenting this wonderful session this morning. Um, thank you to all the teachers that joined us today. We will make sure that the link and the recording is posted on all of our one and portal sites and sent out to the system as well, as I know there were a lot of teachers who were interested who weren't able to be here today. So I'm really glad that we'll have this for them going forward when they actually come back um, for the school year and, and start their um, positions again. And I just wanted to say, Justin, I, I really appreciated, well, so many of the things that all of you said, but I really appreciated your point about how operating in this way is now a core teaching skill and that we can't go back from this. This is the way forward. And the ways in which we change and adapt our practice in order to be culturally inclusive benefits not only newcomer students or people that are new in the province, but it benefits everyone. So I, I really appreciate all the practical information and 
and the background information that you shared this morning. And I'm really looking forward to sharing this with other teachers. So thank you all so much. A pleasure. Thank you one and all. We'll finish out the session here and hope you have a rest restful, one, wonderful uh, week. Good luck as you go back into the session. I hope everything goes as smoothly as possible under the circumstances. Thanks one and all. Thank you everyone.